All right, so now let's talk about a more advanced form of carbocation rearrangement here. And I'm going to draw, we're going to work two examples, but we're going to start with this bigger example first. So carbocation, carbocation rearrangement, what we move can really be anything that's on an adjacent carbon. So we, we, you do, we do hydrogen methyl shifts because they're pretty common. But the reason they're pretty common is that these tend to be limited by what's considered, um, basically it goes to the square root of the mass of what's moving. So basically, if you have a really heavy, something like a methyl group weighs 17 AMUs versus a hydrogen that weighs, weighs 1 AMU, the hydrogen is going to move pretty quickly because it's pretty light, but that methyl group is going to move slower than the hydrogen because it weighs a lot more. Like there is a mass associated with this movement and that mass limits how quickly the reaction can occur. So if you had something where you could do both a methyl and a hydride shift and end up with the same like tertiary carbocation, you're going to get predominantly the hydrogen shift version because that just kinetically goes faster. But that doesn't mean other things can't move. It's just we don't observe them because they weigh a lot. So let's say we take this compound here. We've got a quaternary carbon next to a primary carbocation and we can move three groups. So let's say we move the methyl group. This would give us a tertiary carbocation if we move the ethyl group. One, two, three. That would give us a tertiary carbocation. And if we were to move the propyl group, uh, one, two, two. it would give us this carbocation. So we've actually got three possibilities. We could move the methyl, the ethyl, and the propyl groups and all these result in a tertiary carbocation. And odds are we will get some mixture of these. But the one that's going to predominate here is the methyl group, this methyl shift. And the reason this can predominate is that it's not that it ends up generating any more or less stable carbocation. These are all tertiary carbocations. It's just that the methyl group weighs a lot less. And because it weighs a lot less, it can shift faster. So when it comes to carbocation rearrangements, we're not limited just to methyl and hydrogen groups. We can be, we can, have, we can have ethyl, we can have propyl, we can have tert-butyl, all these groups, but what's gonna limit these and what will decrease their likelihood of being observed is the fact that they move as the square, they move as the square root of mass. The heavier they get, the slower they move. And so while it may occur, it's gonna occur at a much slower rate and therefore the proxy gonna be harder to see. Now, there's also a special case here. And the special case is what's called a ring opening um, carbocation rearrangement. Now, this is a situation where if you think about it in terms of the square root of mass, this is going to look like it doesn't really happen. There is a driving force for this, and it has to do with the stability of the rings. Six membrane rings are the most stable rings in organic chemistry because they, they have geometries closest to tetrahedral carbons. And if we can take a carbocation and rearrange it in such a way that we generate a six membered ring, we are far more likely to generate this compound. So in this case, I have two options. I can shift to hydrogen, and if I shift to hydrogen, I will get this compound here. Now, this would kinetically be very fast, but thermodynamically, it's not the most favorable product. What would be more favorable here is to shift this up. And when we break this bond and shift this up, this ends up giving us cyclo Hexene. Now you may sit back and say, well, this is a secondary versus a tertiary. Why would the secondary more, be more stable than the tertiary? It has to do with ring strain. Your cyclopentane is more strained than the cyclohexane. Now, kinetically, this would be the fastest, but if you give it sufficient energy for that activation barrier, for that shift, this will actually be the product you isolate in large numbers. And again, the reason being here is that by moving this ring and taking it from a five member ring to a six member ring, we're reducing a lot of ring strain. And you can see this with um, some carbocation rearrangements. What will happen is that we end up actually opening a ring bigger and bigger. Um, we can make rings larger by using this carbocation rearrangement. Now again, these are kind of special cases, um, the previous example and this one. If you see rings, do keep in mind that this is not an uncommon occurrence. It's just something to look out for. The previous example, much more esoteric, you're probably not going to be uh, ask those types of questions. But again, it is good kind of good to know that when we talk about in organic chemistry, methyl and hydride shifts, the H and the CH3 shifts, they're not the only ones that go on. They're a nice introduction to this technique or to this concept, 
But in reality, you can get all types of carbocation rearrangements as long as you're driving towards a more stable carbocation and a thermodynamically more stable product.